Good afternoon, everybody. I think that we're about ready to go. We have people still signing in, and I think they probably will for the next little while. Um, but we'll go ahead. Um, so welcome to the Grain Drying and Storage webinar. My name is Morgan Cott. I'm the field agronomist for the Manitoba Corn Growers Association. Um, this webinar is brought to you by the Manitoba Canola Growers Association, Manitoba Corn Growers Association, Manitoba Wheat and Barley Growers Association, the National Sunflower Association of Canada, and the Canola Council of Canada. As you can see, their um, logo is in the bottom corner of that, so you can thank for bringing this webinar to you. As commodity organizations, we decided this was a great fall to go ahead with some kind of grain drying and storage session. A webinar, of course, works great because no one needs to travel and we, we all have the webinar recorded and archived so that it can be, be viewed by anyone in the future. All of the organizations um, I spoke about will have the recording available on their website by next week, I think. So also in the side task bar that you have, um, there's a handouts tab where you'll find both presentations that are available to download if you're interested in printing them off and following as we go along. Um, so today we're very fortunate to have two experts on drying and storage. I'll introduce Dr. Hellbank first, and then he can proceed with his presentation. Then I'll introduce Charlie Springer from PAMI, um, and she'll present. We'll save questions until the end. Um, I have a few questions from Twitter. If we have time, you can enter your questions in that questions tab on the task bar. Dr. Kenneth Helving, pictured here. Ken has a PhD, a PhD degree in engineering, uh, is a registered professional engineer, and has obtained the academic rank of tenured professor at North Dakota State University. As an extension outreach engineer of agriculture and biosystems engineering at North Dakota State University, he's provided education and technical assistance in grain drying and storage structures with focus on energy efficiency, indoor environmental engineering, primarily related to moisture and mold, and flood preparation and recovery to farmers, citizens, agribusiness, and professionals across the U.S. and internationally since 1980. He has a long bio here. <laughs> he has conducted research on numerous grain drying and storage topics, including moisture content changes in stored grain during summer drying and storage of edible beans, air temperature increase due to grain drying and aeration fans, aeration duct design, and soybean storage. In addition, he developed a system for and has conducted numerous grain dryer energy audits. He's been an expert witness and consultant for several clientele. He currently serves as interim chair of the NDSU Department of Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering. He and his wife, Myrna, live in Fargo, have three adult children and seven grandchildren. So I will pass uh, the stage on to Dr. Hellebang. And you can proceed whenever you're ready. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this fall is certainly offering us many, many challenges uh, across all the different commodities that we are, are working with. Uh, and I've tried to select or identify some key topics that I'm receiving questions on and uh, we'll have time at the end of the two presentations to do additional uh, Q&A. So 
as we're going through, if you've got additional questions, things that you want me to elaborate on, uh, feel free to uh, jot them down and hopefully we'll have time to go through those. One of the questions uh, that I've been getting uh, frequently is uh, farmers who are thinking of, of leaving their corn stand in the field over winter to obtain drying uh, out in the field. And certainly that will occur. Uh, this chart or table shows that as we get to the cold temperatures of winter though, that the amount of moisture removal ends up being very small. Uh, and so, yes, we will uh, probably go from in the upper 20% moisture range to about 20% moisture over winter. Um, but that, of course, will come with, with some risks. So leaving it out there for an extra week or two really doesn't change the moisture content a whole lot. So uh, if we have people that are considering, do I leave the corn stand or harvest, uh, keep that in mind. Also been getting a lot of questions related to uh, what I call the corn flowability issue, that if we are looking at, at extremely wet uh, corn out in the, in the field, uh, can I harvest that, put it in the bin, and, and will it come out again? Based on previous experience, uh, what we have found is that if we're in the upper 20s, that 27 to 28 percent moisture range, the kernels do have enough surface moisture on them that they will bind together or freeze together. Uh, those that are harvested at temperatures below freezing stay below freezing and are unloaded as we're going through uh, the winter months will probably do okay, but uh, there is that danger of them not flowing out, even down to about 24 to 25% moisture. I really uh, feel that in order to assure that we're not going to have any flowability problems that we need to be at less than 24% moisture. And of course, foreign material in there impacts it as well. As we're making the decision as to whether we should leave it out in the field or not, uh, we've talked about that we're probably going to be in the 19 to 21% moisture range. But there's also the danger of field losses. And anyone that is considering leaving the corn stand, I'm strongly encouraging that they check the stock strength, uh, starting to get reports of corn that, that did have weak stocks. Uh, if you go out there and push on the stocks, they're tipping over. Uh, and they might look like that field in the bottom left picture. Also, we should check and see how well the, the corn ear is attached to the stock, that uh, if that is not bound well, uh, then we'll end up lo losing the cobs on the ground, and that ends up to be a very significant loss. There will be snow accumulation, of course, over winter, uh, and that's shown in the bottom right picture. And uh, here in North Dakota, we typically have four feet or more of snow accumulate over winter. Uh, if that's standing out in the cornfield, that amounts to about four inches of water. And as that uh, melts in the spring, that's going to create some very wet soils. In addition to that, uh, the corn tends to create a shade or sheltering effect. Uh, slowing down the, the dry down of that soil in the field. So my recommendation really is to harvest, if we're going to leave it stand, to harvest uh, into February or during March uh, before we have any chance of the uh, ground melting and, and running into trouble that way. 
also wanted to spend just a little bit of time uh, talking about the uh, ability of our moisture meters to accurately measure the moisture content. Most all of our meters are calibrated around 15% moisture. And when we start trying to measure corn moisture contents at 25, 26% moisture, there's going to be an error. Uh, we can't necessarily quantify just how much error that will be because uh, it's going to vary from meter to meter. Uh, but we do know that, that it could be off a point or two. Also, uh, most of our meters need to make adjustments based on temperature. That uh, if we're uh, particularly at cold temperatures, some of our meters are not even accurate at that uh, temperature. And all of my uh, numbers here are gonna be in degrees Fahrenheit, uh, but as we're approaching temperatures near freezing, verify whether your meter is is making adjustments and is accurate at that uh, temperature because that too can cause a significant error. Most of our moisture meters are more sensitive to the outside of the kernel than the true moisture throughout the kernel, which can cause us problems. Uh, if we have a condition where corn is coming out of a dryer where the outside is, is drier than the inside, that's gonna fool the meter. Or if we have a scenario where there's condensation on the surface of the kernel, that too uh, will cause the meter to be in air. In both cases, we really can't predict exactly what that uh, error will be. Uh, so I really recommend that we check the moisture content with our meter, place the sample in a sealed container let it sit for six to 12 hours uh, so that we come to equilibrium and then recheck the moisture content to verify uh, if the meter is being fooled and likely how much that meter is being fooled. This is a, a table that shows uh, the recommended long-term storage moisture contents of some of our different uh, crops. Uh, and the numbers may be slightly different depending on climatic conditions. This is assuming uh, summertime temperatures of 70 degrees. And it says 60% relative humidity here on the slide because I like to uh, keep the relative humidity within the spaces uh, within the kernels under uh, about 60 to 65 percent. At 70 percent, we'll typically see some mold growth starting to occur. So if we're sitting with something that is going to go into summer storage or long-term storage, uh, these are the target moisture contents that we would need to be looking for or targeting toward. However, if we're starting to try to figure out what we can get by with, uh, I refer people to this table that I have, which is the approximate allowable storage time for cereal grains based on some deterioration taking place, but not uh, a total spoilage of the grain. And so if we're working with corn and we'll just pick on 24% uh, moisture corn, and if we're at uh, 130 uh, degrees, we've got about 130 days of allowable storage time. So as long as we keep that wet corn cold at temperatures below freezing, we can store that corn for an extended period of time through the winter without any quality loss or major change in quality. However, if we get into uh, a condition where we're seeing temperatures of the grain around 40 degrees, then we only have about 40 days. <clears throat> this becomes important for us because I have a number of, of farmers now that are harvesting high moisture corn 
put it into storage, uh, basically wet storage, with the expectation that they're going to be able to take that corn out and run it through their drying system uh, fairly soon. And that might be within a month, it might be within two months, as long as they keep the temperature of that grain cold below freezing, we can do that. Uh, but it is going to require uh, airflow through the grain in order to uh, hold that wet grain uh, for drying at a later point. So let's talk a little bit about our options for drying this high moisture corn. Uh, most of it is probably going to need, if it's very high moisture, going to need to run through some type of a high temperature dryer. Uh, there's a tendency uh, when we have high moisture grain to, uh, I call it, push the system a little bit. We're running with higher temperatures than what we would probably uh, think would be optimum. Uh, therefore, we're drying a little bit faster. Also, uh, we're probably in the dryer for a longer period of time just because of the high moisture grain. The fast drying, the fast cooling typically will end up with broken kernels and a lower final test weight. A uh, number of guys this year are even looking at it as a, a two-stage process where they're harvesting their corn at maybe 27, 28% moisture, running it through the high temperature dryer, bringing it down to 20, 21% moisture, and then are storing it until they can finish drying or brings it down to the point where they could do natural air low temperature drying. I'm not hearing a lot of reports uh, of any caramelizing taking place, but certainly anytime we have uh, high temperatures, uh, we're, we have the potential of, of scorching the kernel or causing damage to the kernel and reducing the plenum temperature is one of the things that we can do to try to maintain the quality of that grain. Some are, are trying to make a, a decision between leaving the corn in the field and the losses that will occur there versus the cost of doing the drying. Just as kind of a rule of thumb, uh, I typically will use the top equation, uh, assuming an average of about 2,500 BTUs required to take out a pound of water. Uh, and so if we're working with propane, we can estimate what the, the propane or energy cost would be by taking 0 0.022 times whatever the propane price is. So if we're looking at $1.50 per gallon propane, that ends up being about three cents per bushel per point of moisture removed. Uh, if we're taking off 10 points, we're then looking at about 30 cents a bushel uh, as a drying cost. So as we start making a comparison between uh, what our drying cost might be versus leaving that corn in the field and the field losses, uh, this is an easy way to, to at least get a ballpark estimate. One of the things that uh, I think people need to keep in mind is that the colder the air is outside, the more energy it's going to take to heat that air. And this is a table that I put together that really looks at how drastically that can change that if we're looking at, uh, let's say, quote, an average year where we might be drying when it's 40 degrees outside uh, with a dollar twenty propane, that ended up to be about 14 cents per bushel, taking off uh, not quite five points of moisture. If we do it when outside temperatures are zero, again, degrees Fahrenheit, that jumps up to about 19 cents a bushel. So the colder it is, uh, certainly the, the more it's going to cost us to, to do the drying. 
and that too needs to be uh, factored in as we're making our decisions of do I dry now, do I wait, uh, what's going to be the, the ramifications of that. One of the questions that is uh, causing a lot of irritation this year is that test weight is not behaving the way it does most years. Most years as we dry the, the corn, we would expect the test weight to be increasing. Uh, some of the primary things that affect the test weight change as we're drying is the amount of kernel damage, the drier temperature that we're working with, to some extent, even the corn variety. This year where we're talking about high moisture corn, I think we're seeing where we have more mechanical damage. Uh, the higher the moisture content, the more fragile that kernel becomes. The colder it is, uh, the more fragile that kernel becomes. And so we're seeing a much higher uh, mechanical damage over here on the left side uh, of our chart. Then when we look at what we would expect the test weight increase to be as, as we're drying, what we see is that mechanical damage makes quite a, a impact on the increase in test weight. So in most years, I say that we would normally expect to have about a quarter to a third of a pound increase in test weight uh, as we take off a point of moisture. This year, that's unfortunately on the corn calls that I'm getting not happening. I think there, there's a couple of things that are contributing to that. In addition to the, the harvest damage, uh, some of the literature shows that the cool fall, um, even though the corn may have re reached physiological maturity, uh, didn't fill that kernel out the way that it would if we had warmer temperatures. Uh, so, Unfortunately, I'm getting a lot of calls on corn that might be 49 or 50 pound test weight, and it just isn't increasing much going through the dryer. One of the typical recommendations is, is to reduce the drying temperature uh, so that we're more gentle on the drying, and, and that helps maintain the test weight. Uh, if you look at dryer designs, many of the dryers today have some type of diverters or other means of mixing the corn as it comes down through the drying column. And uh, what we would typically expect then is, is that is more gentle on the corn. It's not exposed to the heat as long, and therefore we would expect a, a higher test weight. And again, we're seeing maybe a little of that benefit this year, but not as much as what we would hope or anticipate. Now I'm just gonna run through a, a series of slides very quickly to give you some of my general guidelines on uh, some of the other types of drying systems. Anybody that's doing air drying or natural air low temp drying, the maximum moisture content that I recommend is one. CFM or moisture content is 21% moisture, airflow rate one CFM per bushel. Uh, unfortunately, that does not work well at temperatures as we get near or below freezing. And so we're basically holding it over winter and doing the drying in the spring. This is a, a chart that I put together to just emphasize that we can add supplemental heat uh, typically, we would think that would be a benefit and it helps us a little bit, but unfortunately, when it's so cold outside, uh, we're primarily over drying the grain, uh, obtaining a lower moisture content than desired, and we're still looking at very long drying times.
And that, of course, is related to the, the moisture holding up capacity of the air. And here we can see that as the temperature decreases, the amount of pounds of water that can be held uh, goes down significantly. And uh, we get to the point where it just isn't uh, holding enough moisture to make it worth the effort. Spring drying, in contrast, works very well. Uh, again, I recommend starting the fans when outside temperatures are averaging above uh, about 40 degrees, and, and that then will allow us to do spring drying. With canola, uh, listed here some different moisture contents and the typical types of drying temperatures that are recommended. Uh, Generally, we need to limit the temperatures uh, as the moisture content increases. And that's going to be true pretty much with all our types of grain. Natural air drying uh, generally would work fairly well uh, if we were doing it in September and October. But again, as we get late fall, uh, early winter, moisture holding capacity is going to be gone. The other thing, of course, that, that most of all of you are familiar with is that at these uh, airflow rates, which are required, we have to limit the grain depth in order to uh, get enough airflow through in order to do natural air drying. Couple slides on wheat. Uh, normally what I recommend is 17% is the maximum moisture content need an airflow rate of about three quarters of a CFM per bushel, and it'll take about 31 days. But that's assuming uh, a temperature of about 70 degrees. And once we get into a late fall, uh, we really need to just shut the system down, hold it over winter, and do the drying in the spring. And this just shows, again, that in the spring, uh, as we look at typical April conditions is roughly equivalent to October, uh, May conditions fairly similar to September. And so generally my recommendation is with wheat that we hold it uh, and wait to dry until we're getting closer to 50 degree temperatures uh, rather than the 40 that I talked about earlier for corn. Soybeans uh, would be similar for uh, sometimes sunflower. Uh, we typically in soybeans need to limit the temperature in order to not damage the, the seeds. Uh, sunflower, we typically can handle higher heats but in both cases, uh, we have a fire dry, a drier fire hazard when we're drying that grain. Uh, the pods, trash, uh, other things accumulate in the dryer become combustible. So it's critical that we keep the grain flowing in the dryer, keep uh, that dryer clean, and then constantly monitor it. So. Quick run through, uh, primarily focusing on corn, touching a little bit on some of the other types. Uh, high temperature drying would still be working this time of year, but as far as air drying, uh, we're probably in a hold pattern until spring when hopefully conditions will be better. Thanks, Dr. Halavang. I'll just change my screen over here quickly. So if anybody has noticed the handouts in the task bar, Dr. Halavang has his presentation there in a PDF file. He has a little bit extra information on storage as well. So it's a good handout to download, I would say, if you haven't done that already. Uh, so thank you again, Dr. Hellevang, for providing that information for us. Next, we've got Charlie Springer from PAMI, 
at the Prairie Agricultural Machinery Institute in Portage Prairie, Manitoba, presenting. Charlie received her degrees in biological engineering from the University of Saskatchewan with a focus on biomass handling and processing. Since joining PAMI in 2017, she's been instrumental in their grain storage research program aimed at providing producers with the tools and knowledge to make informed decisions on their farms. Charlie also leads a variety of projects on the agronomics and logistics of on-farm practices. Her family raises a beef cattle herd near Rivers, Manitoba. So Charlie, I will pass it over to you now. One half a moment. And you can take over when you're ready. Thanks, Morgan, um, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, definitely happy to be, it's a, it's a fall that this is definitely a, a hot topic and lots of information. Um, I'd really like to, to segue onto the grain storage principles and take more of a, a basic principles approach. Um, it's how we like to do some of our um, extension presentations, really providing a set of tools and um, Flow, process flow of decision making for, for producers to use uh, when storing their grain. Um, a lot of this presentation will focus more on wheat and canola, as those are some of our main, main commodities on the prairies, but uh, Dr. Hellevang talked about corn a lot, so that fills in some of the gaps. So just to go through a couple of different topics, basics. Uh, looking different some tools, new technologies, and touch on supplemental heat, maybe a few additional things to Dr. Hellevay mentioned. Uh, but if anything, the take home message uh, from this presentation that uh, all types of grain storage and aeration require proper monitoring and management. So the better understanding you have of your system, uh, the better management decisions you can make. So we know there's lots of different um, options for storing your grain from bins, um, bags, etc. I'm going to focus mostly on in-bin, um, or I'm going to, uh, but the same principles apply across just different management practices. So our issue really is avoiding spoiled grain. The, the important thing is that Potential for spoilage depends on both temperature and moisture, um, and that, um, and that the chance of spoiling when it's hot or moist um, affects insect, fungal, um, etc. So the key again is both temperature and moisture. It's most uh, most are aware. Um, we need to cool and dry that grain for safe storage. Uh, so you can limit these variations in temperature and moisture by blowing air through the grain. And this helps even out temperature variations. Um, but blowing hot air uh, does dry grain more effectively because um, the more, more warmer the air, the greater its ability to hold moisture. Um, so, but heating air for grain does cost money. So, trying to find the best management principles. So, moisture variations are also, as well as temperature are uh, key and that we want to, to mitigate any moisture migration or hot uh, spots um, that could could be prone to spoilage. So these are just examples of some convection currents which affect as well as airflow through the bin when you have aeration. Um, so the Canadian Grain Commission has safe target storage condition charts they can be used as guidelines for various commodities. I'm not sure that corn is one of the charts available um, on their site, but most of the other commodities are there. Keep in mind that these are these are guidelines, um, and that uh, pockets of high moisture, uh, high temperature grain can uh, create problem areas. So really, um, being able to to monitor your bin conditions is important. But we can we can condition our dry grain if it comes off the field too hot or wet um, using uh, heated air or natural air drying. Uh, 
So aeration versus natural air drying, Dr. Helving uh, talked on both a bit, but the difference comes down to, to what we're trying to achieve. So aeration, we're just cooling the grain, conditioning, um, low airflow rates around that 0.1 CFM per bushel. Um, if the air is cooler, the grain will cool, straightforward, um, take up to about a week to equalize depending on your ambient conditions. Um, this is really, this is mostly used um, earlier in the, the harvest season when we're trying to cool the grain as it comes off the field. Um, but this time of year as well as we're putting in the bin, it just won't take as long. Um, natural air drying, if we're harvesting tough, we can get some reduced moisture uh, in the grain as we put it in the bin with higher airflow rates if the uh, air has capacity to dry, which I'll uh, go back into a little bit more. But we want, yeah, airflow rates up around one to two CFM per bushel depending on the commodity. Once again, ambient conditions really affect. So if we have cool, humid weather, it's, we're not going to achieve the same drying. Um, but as a general rec recommendation, we want to, if you can, run your fans continuously to, to keep the, the grain bulk conditioned, cool temperatures, and evenness throughout the bin. Uh, regardless of what we're talking about, aeration and natural air drying, it's all about the airflow rate. Um, each specific fan, um, the airflow rate will depend on static pressure in the bin, and static pressure depends on grain type. Um, so the smaller the seeds, the smaller the voids, um, so greater resistance to push it through through the grain bulk. Uh, depth of grain has effect, so the, the greater your grain depth, how full your bin is, the greater resistance. Airflow rate, the, the faster you try and push air through the grain, the greater the resistance to airflow. And distribution system, so your ducting system, um, depending on the setup, will also add to the static pressure. This is an example of a, um, a fan a chart table. Um, you might also see uh, fan curves. Yeah. And the, uh, so this is what you'll def definitely see from your fan uh, manufacturer, and you can, depending on, if you know what static pressure you're going to get from your depth of, or your, your grain bulk, this, you can use this to select a fan, or if you have a fan fit on your bin, um, you can work backwards and see how how deep you can fill your bin in order to get the airflow rate that you want to achieve. Um, and then if you want to look at your, uh, find your static pressure charts, there's charts available uh, generally to estimate. We've got some available on PAMI.ca. Um, we fortunately didn't get these in this presentation. Um, but you can also get, um, measure your static pressure on your, your fan outlet to measure your actual in the bin to see if you're maxing out your static pressure. Um, other, yeah, other bin considerations, bin fill, there's some, some research has said that if you can even out the, the bin, you'll get more um, uniform uh, drying or airflow through the bin. Uh, is it, the air will go through path of least resistance if it's all level. Um, exhaust vents, this plays in particularly when we're adding heat and trying to grain. Um, if you have exhaust vents, then uh, prevent condensation on the roof uh, falling down the walls to the grain. So if you can vent it out, out of the top, that's, that's useful. Other aeration drying challenges, um, small seeds, so high static pressure, we talked, to, I mentioned that. So possibly might have to fill your bin only a quarter or halfway, um, it, depending on how, how tough that grain is to reduce the static pressure and get more efficient drying and then move it to another bin. Um, some crops will respire for up to six weeks after harvest. So moisture can be generated during that time. So that's another reason to have, have your fans uh, run constantly for 
for the first while anyways until maintain uh, equilibrium and as well as green seed will uh, can result in high moisture pockets and then heating and spoilage so there's uh, been a lot of talk about one past several years of when the best time to run natural air drying fans um, IHARF Indian Head had published a recommendation just to run fans at night, um, but there's really no there's no one perfect answer uh, that was trying to generalize it. Uh, so the best strategy really is depending on depends on your condition, your grain type, moisture. Um, so using those tools and <coughs> using those tools and figuring out what makes sense for your situation. So I mentioned that uh, we can achieve some drying when it has the air has the capacity to dry. So the ability of air to hold moisture depends on its temperature and <coughs> equilibrium moisture content, which we refer to often as the EMC, is a function of air temperature, air humidity, and grain type. So each commodity is a little different. Um, so I have an example in a minute, but here are the charts that you can see. We have these available on our website as well for reference. Uh, so example, this is wheat and at a relative humidity of 70% and a temperature of 10 degrees, if this is your ambient conditions, if it's maintained over time, um, your, your grain bulk will eventually equilibrate to 15.7%. Similar to canola. So, if you're uh, but really this this theory too is complex because uh, mass transfer water between air and grain is complex uh, but it can be used as a tool and a guideline uh, for estimating when the air has the capacity to dry and manage your fans even though it fluctuates through the grain we'll have an average daily temperature and humidity we can use So just as a representative that people find useful to to see when um, grain has capacity to dry, <coughs> so we've got uh, warm air, um, humidity hits the cool grain, and uh, yeah, and then we've got cool air at night, air at midnight hits the warm grain, uh, so we've got a bigger cup. So we use a cup analogy for how much capacity it has to dry. So we overflow the smaller the cup. When we have warm air, the cup gets smaller, but we have the same amount of moisture in it, so it overflows and gets some rewetting. Whereas if we have that cooler air, our humidity as we the uh, the grain causes the air to warm up, the cup becomes bigger and it has more room to take up take up moisture. So in general, yeah, if we have warm air and warm grain, we get some drying. Warm air, cool grain, wetting, cool air and warm grain. We get some short-term drying until it steadies. And then cool air and cool grain, we get some minor wetting. <coughs> so in the answer to when's the best time to run your, your fans, really depends on your goal. If you're trying to get safe storage for all grain types, just run fans continuously um, to keep things even in the bin. If you're trying to minimize your fan hours, run fans when greatest capacity to dry. You can turn them on and off. That's not always the most effective or most realistic to turn them on and off. Just wanting to cool the grain, run them at night only. Um, if you have a high capacity fan or continuously with low capacity, and even moisture content profile with no over drying run during the day, and then just aerate to even it out. <coughs> in any of these cases, um, monitoring your bin and knowing what's happening in it uh, is really important so that you, you know, if you have problem areas, you can mitigate fast or you can decide when, how long you need to run your fans for. So here's just some examples of 
technologies out there from your moisture sensing cables um, to uh, new 3D mapping, for example, grain biz. Um, Dr. Helvang definitely touched on supplemental heating. Uh, it's not the same as heated air drying. Um, we're just adding heat to your natural air drying in bin systems. <coughs> but it allows us to extend season of good drying up to uh, up to 20 degrees. So that's what that's good considered good drying is in that 20 degrees. So uh, when we're in that zero to 10 um, or even slightly lower, we can try and bump that bump that season up longer so we don't have to put everything through the dryer. Uh, still using natural air drying airflow rates, but that's important. We have to make sure we have sufficient airflow. So good drying weather, like I said, requires temperatures above 10 degrees Celsius and lower humidity below 70. Um, anything below that, any possible drying, even if the equilibrium moisture content and humidity is uh, lower, it's the drying rate will be very slow. The rule of thumb that we recommend is limit your temperature increase to 10 degrees or less uh, to reduce uh, fuel costs <coughs> and uh, unevenness through the bin. Uh, don't exceed inlet temperatures of 20 degrees or so, 20 Celsius. Once your inlet te temperature drops below five, you're not getting uh, very much drying, like I mentioned. Uh, rule of thumb is that for every increase in temperature of 10 degrees, the RH of the air is effectively cut in half, so you drastically increase the capacity of the air to dry. <coughs> Uh, make sure you can get sufficient airflow above one, around one CFM per bushel, and that you have adequate ventilation to get that moisture right out of the bin, avoid condensation. So this is the example of where the humidity, or by the humidity is cut in half for 10 degrees increases. Air, so your equilibrium moisture content of where you're Grain can be dried to um, is much further down. <coughs> so just a few examples. I'm not going to touch on this too much, but they'll be in the, the handout for you to look at. And there's more resources on our, our site for sizing your heater and deciding what you need uh, to, to achieve some drying. Uh, these are out, uh, old. Uh, cost of fuel, but just example um, in that 50 cents to three dollars per hour in fuel, depending on type of system. So these are some examples. You can add heating systems upstream, downstream. Yeah, there's definitely different options. So some are easier to implement. The upstream suitable for just transferring between bins and retrofitting, or downstream slightly more energy efficient, um, but requires more difficult installation. A um, couple years ago, we did uh, some, some research looking at store, uh, summer storage. So we're looking now at once, once we've stored the grain in the bin and we've got it through the winter, even if it was a little tough, how do we a lot of questions about what do we do in the spring um, if we have to store it. So I'm um, not going to touch too much on that. That's our conclusion. So really, they, we looked at um, uh, aerating the bin, turning the bin, um, or just leaving it alone. So found that leave, uh, leaving it alone was actually the best option. This is for canola. Um, Plenty of heat migration, but no moisture migration. Um, so the, it maintained fairly stable as it was coming out. So we talked a lot, I talked a lot about natural air drying, but as far as aeration, uh, just best management practices. Uh, we want to run those fans continuously until we've 
cooled our grain sufficiently, low airflow rate, and just to even out the, the temperature distribution. Um, so, but if in the case that we're not able to dry tough grain before winter, either the not not feasible to add supplemental heat or you don't have a, a heated air dryer, you can freeze grain by aerating in cold temps, um, but really um, you should try and uh, haul your grain before the temperatures warm up too much. Um, you don't want to store it over summer. <coughs> Well, these I already mentioned, talking about other drying challenges. Those are, apologies, those are duplicated, but important to keep in mind. So there's a lot of overlap from uh, what Dr. Helving uh, mentioned for drying in bin, but really it's maintaining uh, safe storage conditions and trying to uh, manage that in your bin um, as you take it off harvest and going into into the winter. So requires management of both temperature and moisture. Main difference between aeration and natural air drying is airflow rate. Um, many factors affect that air capacity to dry, so you got to look at the conditions that you have, the type of grain you're storing. Um, supplemental heat is a good option, um, and uh, but if you have to, get it cool and keep it cool. Uh, through the winter. Uh, so just monitor and manage, as I mentioned. We've got quite a few other resources. These are just the overview for today, um, but at pami.ca slash storage. Um, and I wanted to thank uh, Manitoba Agriculture for supporting some of this extension work. Um, I'm going to be speaking at Crop Connect uh, in February, uh, hoping to revamp this presentation in um, change it a bit to, to answer some more questions from some of this fall and some of the challenges we had. So definitely looking for some feedback on information that you're looking, um, producers are looking for. Um, I think that's it for, for me. Perfect, thanks. Uh, thanks, Charlie. I'll, I'll just switch over here again. So I'm getting a few um, questions or comments that for some reason I couldn't get the handout of your presentation, Charlie, to load in the handouts. It's not working properly. So if anybody wants it, um, email to them. They can send me an email at morgan at manitobacorn.ca if they want it. And it'll be good for if you want to review um, this webinar once it's archived. Um, I'm sure you could send an email to Charlie too if you wanted the the PDF version of the presentation as well. So my apologies for that. Dr. Hellebangs is working just fine, it seems, but for some reason the other PDF isn't. Um, so we had some questions from Twitter using the hashtag grain storage19. I'm gonna post them up here so we can view them and fire them away. Uh, um, sorry, here we go. Can you guys see my screen now? Yep. Hopefully that's yes. <laughs> okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, first question. Um, I'm not sure which one of you might want to answer this. What is the margin of error with grain moisture meters, particularly with low temperature and or very damp grain? Do you have an answer for that? Well, I'll take a first crack at it. And I don't know that we can really uh, indicate what the error would be. Uh, it's going to depend on the meter. It's going to depend on... Uh, the operating conditions but would be just safe in saying that uh, as I indicated in my comments earlier that uh, temperature is a contributing factor that is looked at when we measure uh, the grain moisture content and that could cause an error easily of at least a couple three percentage points uh, and the same thing with very wet grain uh, that 
since calibration is typically around 13 to 15 percent moisture for most of our cereals that uh, if we're up in the 25 percent range it would be very easy to be off uh, a couple percentage points or more so um, can't give a specific number but just that there certainly would be an error And I'll do a first attempt at this one, and then uh, we'll go from there. Uh, there's a lot of different designs in dryers, and um, there's uh, pros and cons with with various aspects of, of what is in incorporated into a dryer. Uh, if there was one best method, I, there would, all the dryers would be the same. But there are uh, a variety of features, a variety of ways of accomplishing the, the end goal of drying the grain. Uh, in general, I, uh, you know, we could walk through some of the operating characteristics of each one, uh, but I think the the end result is that um, there is not one best type uh, and each design is going to be operated a little bit differently to obtain the best efficiency and, and drying uh, parameters. So uh, we will see a variation from dryer to dryer. Okay, thank you. I like this one. How does freeze drying work or does it? Is it ever practical to dry cold grain with cold air? At what moisture content? Is it a concern for the bulk to set up or freeze solid in the bin? Charlie, do you want to do that one? Sure, I'll take try. Uh, so I, I really can't say what the moisture content uh, would be to to result in freeze solid, at least for for wheat and canola. Um, but if if it comes down to it, that uh, it's definitely an option to try and uh, just just get your grain cool. You're not going to achieve much drying by blowing uh, cold air in it, uh, but you'll at least have grain that's uh, safe to store, and your risk of spoilage um, is a lot lower. So. We definitely haven't done much work in this area, um, but it is an interesting thing that might be worth looking at. And I guess I would take a, a stab at the first part, uh, freeze drying work. Uh, and I usually use the scenario that we can hang clothes out on a line in the winter time and moisture will go from the liquid wet phase to freezing and then we'll move from a frozen state to the air uh, and eventually sublimate to the point that we have a moisture reduction. Uh, but we, we could see a little of that happen out in the field, uh, but it's going to be a very, very slow process. As I indicated in my slide uh, during my presentation that Yes, we will see drying occur or a moisture reduction occur if we leave corn stand out in the field over winter, but it's going to happen very, very slowly. And uh, assuming that the wind blows, uh, we might be looking at hundreds of CFM per bushel going by that corn. If we put that grain in the bin uh, and now start trying to move air past it, Again, if you look strictly at the equilibrium moisture contents that Charlie was talking about, yes, it may appear like we are drying, but the rate of drying is going to be so slow that you're going to spend way more electricity than any benefit that you would get. So uh, there's nothing magic about it going through a, a freeze and a thaw cycle. Uh, yes, there will be a moisture change that will occur if there's enough wind blowing by, but to try to freeze dry any grain in the bin 
just isn't practical. As you can probably tell, I've had that question before. <laughs> probably a lot this year. Okay, when drawing using using heated aerations, what's the maximum inlet temperature you can safely use for canola? I'll let Charlie that one. Go on that one. <laughs> Charlie? Um, sorry, I just uh, had a colleague pass uh, answers to these questions that we got in advance, so I'm just grabbing his answer. Um, so really, the maximum inlet temperature would be grain drying temperatures around that 10 to 20, uh, but maximum plenum is usually around 30 uh, Celsius is recommended. Um, if you're using supplemental heating for aeration, uh, you usually want uh, in around that 10 to 20 degrees Celsius, though, to with sufficient airflow to reduce um, any any possible degradation. So, but in heated air drying, I think 30 is recommended. And the one thing that I'll add to that is that anytime we're moving air through grain to dry it in a bin that we do have a, a drying zone where the drying takes place. Uh, the air comes in at a certain relative humidity or moisture content, moves through the grain, picking up moisture from the grain, and then will exit uh, out of the bin. And uh, typically I hear reports, well, the bottom of the bin ends up over dried and the top isn't dry. And of course, that's what's going to happen, particularly when we're adding supplemental heat, because when you go back to the, the tables that Charlie shared, or uh, if you look at equilibrium moisture content charts, that when you heat the air, you're probably ending up down with moisture contents that might be 5 6% moisture. And so the bottom ends up coming into equilibrium with that condition the top is going to be at a higher moisture content. And so either the whole bin will end up at that dry, over what I call over dried condition, or we end up having to stop the, the drying partway through, mix the grain and end up with a mixed moisture content closer to what's desired. Unless you happen to have a market where they will automatically do that. They take and sample each load and average them out over what you're hauling in. Uh, but typically that moisture variation is, is an issue in, in many cases. I don't know if either of you will have the answer for this. What effect does over drying for the purpose of blending with tougher, tougher product have on the oil content of canola? I've also got this question in to Angela Brack and Reed. She's hopefully listening and texting me the answer right now, but I don't know if either of you can answer that. I don't have a specific answer, uh, but working with soybeans and, and sunflower, other oil crops, uh, just drying to a lower moisture content really isn't typically uh, going to cause a problem with the quality of that oil. Uh, if we're using excessive temperatures, that can have an impact on oil quality but the the moisture content is not an issue um, the concern that i would have with that is making sure that we're blending the two together and getting uh, a good mix of that moisture content so that it can equilibrate uh, again i don't have a lot of research on uh, those oil crops, but I know that with the cereal grains, you can mix uh, two different moisture contents together. And I'll usually use the example if we have 20% moisture corn and 10% moisture corn, you average them together and that would be 15. 
but uh, if you actually look at it on a kernel by kernel basis, that even if you mix them together, the 20 comes down a couple points or so, the, the 10 comes up a couple points or so, and you don't end up with kernels that are actually at the average moisture content. Uh, by moving some air through the grain, giving some time for that air to move the moisture content, we can help to equalize that moisture content a little bit more. Uh, but we do not truly end up with kernels that are always at that average moisture content. So blending, that would be more of my concern than, than oil quality. Yeah, and I guess I'll just add, I think it's the, your drying rates and the temperatures you're using to, to dry that canola is more likely to have an effect on the, the oil content than um, the actual moisture content that, uh, that you end up with if you're over dried. So. Okay. Um, with supplemental heat aeration at what ambient temperature does condensation become an issue and what steps can be taken to reduce it? Charlie, you want to do that one? Sure. Um, so I, I can't necessarily say what, uh, give a temperature, it'll definitely depend on the ambient humidity as well and how much moisture you're taking out of your bin. Um, but as far as steps to reduce that, I mentioned um, ventilation, roof ventilation on your bins uh, so that moisture is um, exhausted out or uh, through through the roof rather than running back down um, the bin walls is the concern that producers have. Uh, so that's definitely an option. Yeah, and I'd just add to that that as I'm visiting with people, I remind them that condensation forms on cool surfaces. And the colder it is outdoors, the more likely we will have cold bin roofs and walls. And that then increases the potential for that condensation. So I think that definitely is part of what needs to be considered in addition to how much supplemental heat that we're adding. Uh, I tend to recommend less addition of supplemental heat maybe than what uh, was mentioned earlier. Uh, I, I typically try to keep the supplemental heat when we're doing uh, natural air low temp type drying to uh, something in the neighborhoods of uh, maybe three, four degrees Celsius rather than going more than that. Uh, just because of the potential for over drying and the potential for condensation. Okay. What are the limits of high temperature drying seal, uh, cereals and canola when it's snowing, raining, or high humidity? I'll take a first one on that. Uh, with high temperature drying, uh, usually I'll walk through the the 20 degree, I use Fahrenheit, so it's 20 degrees rather than 10 degrees. Uh, increase in temperature cuts the relative humidity in half. So we can start out with 100% relative humidity outdoors. And as we start adding that supplemental heat, pretty soon we're down to maybe 1% or even in, in the cases of corn, lower uh, relative humidities in the air. So certainly we're not as efficient drying cereals uh, when it's very wet outside, but we can, in a high temperature dryer, continue to do drying even under damp outdoor conditions. Now uh, with a little bit. the kind of uh, canola, lower temperatures that were talked about earlier, uh, they're going to be more impacted, but I think also they're uh, pulling snow or rain in would be more of an issue than, than just the high humidity condition. Okay, 
How are you guys doing for time? We have a couple questions um, from the crowd here. I'm okay. Yep. You okay, Charlie? Yep, we're good. Okay, I'll read them out to you. Um, just a moment here. What would be the optimum relative humidity while storing wheat? Well, if you look back at my uh, table that I shared, I go with uh, looking at the airspace between the kernels as being between 60 and 65% relative humidity. And at that point, we're typically going to have uh, dry enough grain that we're not going to have uh, mold growth and deterioration taking place. So uh, when we're looking at wheat, for example, uh, that ends up in that 13, 13 and a half percent moisture range. If you can be assured that that it's going to be stored cooler than that 70 degrees Fahrenheit that I talked about, then we can go a little bit higher than that in, in moisture content. Over winter, uh, we routinely have people storing uh, anywhere from 16 to 18 percent moisture wheat as long as it's kept cold. But then it, as before we go into a, a warm environment, uh, then I recommend it be dry to that 13, 13 and a half percent. And typically, like I say, that is in the 60 to 65 percent relative humidity range. Yeah, and I agree with everything. Okay. Um, how do you get rid of ice on roof and exposed walls that builds up from condensation? Very good question. <laughs> um, if it's ice on the inside or ice on the outside, I guess I'm assuming it's it's cold enough that they're getting condensation and ice on the inside. And unfortunately, I don't know that there is any kind of easy solution to that. Um, they need to be aware of that condensation and ice issue and probably need to remove the grain uh, before it melts because I get quite a few calls from people that end up with spoiled grain along the bin wall and I'm convinced it's coming from uh, either condensation running down off the roof onto the walls or actually condensation on the wall particularly with corn where we're dumping uh, warm grain coming out of a grain dryer into a bin and, and ending up with condensation along that wall. Yeah, and if you're getting ice build up on the inside, I'd say it's about too late. I'm not sure, yeah, what your options would be. Um, and then, yeah, moving that grain before we, it warms back up uh, will be necessary. Okay. Um, Angela Brackenreed had mentioned on the last question, she has um, a point to make um, for the supplemental heating. Um, you only want to increase the ambient temperature about 15 to 25 degrees Celsius, inlet temperature 30 to 40 degrees, but you need to ensure at least 0.75 CFMs per bushel, ideally at, at least one CFM per, per bushel. Um, so supplemental heat basically is not an option now just because it's too cold outside. We need to use the cold temperatures as our friend and if we have um, tough or damp canola on the farm this winter, um, we can stabilize with freezing temperatures, want to try to get those temperatures as even throughout the profile as possible. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Um, what is the maximum inlet temperature if you want to keep wheat or barley for seed? The general recommendation that I see for maintaining any uh, germination of any of the commodities is 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, I don't have an answer on that one. 
Okay. Okay, so that's about all I have for questions. Um, I'm not seeing anything else really come in. Oh, here's one. Can spontaneous combustion occur in heating canola when a fan is turned on? What does the canola temperature need to be? Um, yes, we, over, over the years, unfortunately, we've seen fires in bins uh, with, with canola, with sunflower in particular, um, that uh, if there's heating that is occurring uh, because of the wet conditions, uh, under certain scenarios that can generate enough heat that it'll eventually switch into a chemical uh, reaction and will elevate to the point of spontaneous combustion. Um, it's not a, a common occurrence, but uh, certainly it, it can occur. And so it's imperative uh, as was mentioned earlier, that we be monitoring the temperature profiles in these bins. And the first thing should be anytime the temperature starts warming up is to run the aeration fans to, to cool it mass down again. Um, I have one final one here. It might be a little bit hard to explain. Um, so combined wheat at 19% moisture during nighttime operation of minus 5 to minus 10 degrees Celsius. The grain went into storage frozen, in quotation marks. So should the grain be rotated or left alone? If it's being rotated, should it be done on a cold day? Um, if it's cold going in, um, I'd say it should be. Uh, and it, it's, the ambient conditions stay cold, um, I would probably leave it alone, um, run some air through it to make sure that the, the conditions are even throughout the whole thing. Um, but at that point, um, unless you want to take it out and dry it, just leave it alone. Yeah, and I'd just add to that that uh, once we get moisture contents up above Oh, about 15%. Uh, I've heard of a number of cases where the respiration heat does start warming the grain. So even though it went in cold, uh, continue to monitor it uh, so that if we do notice that temperature increasing, that, that we can aerate it right away to, to cool it down again. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I think that's about it. We've gone over by about 17 minutes here, so I'll, I'll wrap it up. We still have quite a few people that hung on, so I thank you for, for hanging on to our every words here. Um, thank you again to everybody for attending today's webinar. Um, a huge thank you to Dr. Hellebang for bringing your knowledge on drying and also for lending us your time on the American Black Friday. I think we may have lost some attendees maybe to online shopping today, so we appreciate you um, giving us your time when you could have been with your family instead. So thank you very much for that, Dr. Hellebang. Um, You're very welcome. Charlie Springer, thank you. <laughs> you weren't one of them Black Friday shopping, so we got you. Um, Charlie, thank you for your time and your knowledge today. Um, Charlie and Lauren are our local experts in, in Manitoba with PAMI. Um, they'll also be at several conferences over this winter, um, embellishing on the information that Charlie gave today. So I encourage you guys to um, sort of track them down and see where they'll be presenting over this winter because there'll be lots of important information, I think, for producers out there this, this winter. Um, as I mentioned before, check all of our websites next week for the recordings, um, for the handouts. You can go to the Corn Growers website, Manitoba Canola Growers, National Sunflower Association, Manitoba Wheat and Barley's um, websites, and and possibly even the Canola Council of Canada's websites for these recordings, um, and also the handouts, since I know some of you were having issues with it. Any other questions? I encourage you to um, get a hold of Dr. Hellevang or, or Charlie um, via email in the future for, for questions. So thank you, everybody, again, so much. Hope you have a great weekend, and take care. Thank you. <laughs>